Welcome and thank you for joining Helping Cope with Grief and Loss During Animal Disease Outbreaks. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panel by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note that all audio connections are muted at this time. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentations and you'll receive instructions at that time. We are now launching a poll that will appear on the right-hand side of your screen. Remember to click Submit when you're finished, in, uh, finished filling in your answers. You may collapse the panel by clicking the polling icon on the top left of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Doris Orlander from USDA. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you to those of you who are coming in from the previous webinar. I'm a 17-year veteran of USDA who started out her service with the foot and mouth disease outbreak in the United Kingdom. So today's purpose is to open the door beyond the complex logistics and activities of responding to that outbreak in 2001. This was the, this was the, largest outbreak since the largest supply chain and event since 2001, since World War II. Okay, Cumbria in County in UK is what we'll focus on today. And this is about 2,600 mile, square mile area. However, the green part represents a national park. And so the agricultural area, animal agricultural area, is in the pink area and re represents approximately 15% of the area in there. So who and what were impacted? The who side includes producers and families and children, but the disabled and vulnerable were also impacted, as well as the outbreak and field staff. And not to be forgotten is the office staff who also shouldered a lot of stress. Certainly the contract employees also were impacted and you'll see the numbers of these in a future slide. What included businesses supported by agriculture, equipment suppliers, uh, chemical suppliers, other veterinarians? Unrelated business such as delivery services were also impacted. And hotels and restaurants were impacted both negatively and positively, as tourism was greatly diminished. However, given the number of responders that needed housing and feeding, some hotels and restaurants saw increases of business. Volunteer organizations also found, many found increased demand on their services. And schools were often uh, severely impacted. So I'm going to discuss four important factors. The, this, these aren't limited to these factors, but these stand out. First is the overwhelming speed and scale of outbreak. The second is the invasion of the rural community. The third is the intense public scrutiny and reactions that were not limited to the local area. And last, that the outbreak was a before and after event that even a decade, decade later was remembered in much of the area. So some examples of the impacted activities include many add up to isolation. So these include visiting friends, 96%, Attending shows and fairs, many of which, most of which were canceled, 82%. Attending school, again, uh, there was a great deal of impact on school and children's lives. And even receiving health care in 10% of the population. The overwhelming speed and scale of outbreak makes it very difficult to respond to the human dimension of managing a disease outbreak. This is the bar graph of the outbreak in Cumbria County. And during the 12 week period approximately from late February into late May, 12 weeks, three of those weeks included in that one county 
weeks with three weeks with over 100 cases of disease per week. So the semicircle here represents the approximate concentration of livestock. And you'll be able to see in the map in the subsequent slide the intensity over the course of the outbreak. So 30 weeks later when the outbreak was largely, the cases were largely gone, uh, 893 infected farms were depopulated in this county and an additional 2,000 farms were fully or partially depopulated for animal welfare reasons or danger contact. And in the area, general area, 70% of the farms were partially or fully depopulated. And as you can see on the map, this area was the area of most severe concentration. So the invasion of the community, a quiet rural community is largely is taken over by this disease. So looking at this, you can see the pre-outbreak is has five veterinarians, government veterinarians serving, serving this area and additional support personnel to make approximately 40 staff. At the height of the outbreak, there's nearly a thousand people working this and this is where hotels and housing and all that kind of thing become important. In the next February, when the outbreak is largely determined to be over and a restocking of livestock is taking place, the number of employees serving that area drops back to 33. So not only was the invasion in numbers, but it was also in diversity and people from other places. That included Australia, New Zealand, the U.S., Zimbabwe, Canada, Portugal, and Spain. So factor number three included the intense public and media scrutiny and reactions that were not limited to the local area, but also to the international media. And this public scrutiny had a lot, touched on a lot of aspects of the disease outbreak. The sheer numbers of animals being depopulated, the method of depopulation, disposal of this, and the associated, uh, the associated images with it. So virtually every resident and animal agricultural worker in the county was being continuously exposed to the sights, smells, sounds, associated with the outbreak, as well as the general resident population. And the world was watching all of this and making its judgments. The outbreak was a before and after event for individuals, families, and communities. So the next three slides are going to be from a very small book that collected some of the stories of the individuals in that area. So one from the farm of Jenny, uh, Monday, March 26, early in the outbreak, there is no sound now. Every field is empty, empty, empty. The sheep lie dead beside the silage. The cattle lie dead in the yard at the top of the drive. The next day she writes, a light fall of snow in the night and bitter wind this morning. But the most horrific thing is the terrible silence. You could, until yesterday, hear the cows clanking and lowing and the sheep calling. Now there is just silence with the wind moaning around the front of the house. This reference to silence is found throughout this and the farms go from a place of rhythm and rhythm of noises to a silence where generally only birds are heard. Later in the outbreak, mid-August when it had tapered off, uh, a priest in charge of one of the areas that we worked intensely in, uh, he wrote, the surface problem of no stock is only too evident. It is the long-term effects that are far more worrying. This is a community in shock which feels forgotten, ignored, and isolated. 
And as in the United States, the farming, the farming community is an aging community, and there were a great deal of concerns about who would actually go back into farming and what the impact of losing producers would be. And the last one I'm going to put out there is from a much longer poem by Peter Frost Pennington, who is a veterinarian in the area. Damien Hurst has nothing on me. I create ghastly pictures of death officially sanctioned. This is not what I had trained for. I hope familiarity will never make me immune from the trauma of killing. But I do hope, for the animal's sake, to be good at it. And we also hoped that we were good at it for the owner's sake, who generally watched this or even participated. So now I've set the stage for um, Elizabeth Strand for the Veterinary College and College of Social Work at the University of Tennessee. And there I am, an avid fisherman. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Olander. I really um, appreciate so much you um, setting the stage and bringing home um, this topic. Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit of information about what veterinary social work is and how it applies to our topic today. So um, so the Veterinary Social Work Program was founded in 2002. It's a partnership between the Colleges of Social Work and Veterinary Medicine at the University of Tennessee. And our real focus is attending to the human needs that arise at the intersection of veterinary and social work practice. Um, that's what we have been focusing on um, since 2002. Now, since we're social workers, we are trained, much like public health veterinarians, to always look at a problem uh, from a systems perspective. So if there is an individual that is ex experiencing some type of distress, we never consider that distress in isolation. We always look at the larger microsystem, the home, the family around them, all the way to the larger macrosystem, the culturally, um, cultural values and beliefs that um, influence uh, where the person lives. So we apply this person and environment, the systems perspective, to the model of veterinary social work. Um, there are four areas, animal-assisted interventions, the link between human and animal violence, animal-related grief and bereavement, and compassion, fatigue, and conflict management. And each of these, of course, has a micro and a macro application, many, really, micro and, um, and macro applications. Um, and I would say that today's topic really focuses on um, the two of animal-related grief and bereavement and compassion, fatigue, conflict management. Um, so, you know, I think the thing that is important to take in as we uh, discuss this topic is that there is a part of the job of a veterinarian that is called emotional labor. This topic was really founded in um, hotel management, um, and it basically states that the process of managing feelings and expressions um, and is part of the emotional requirements of the job, to fulfill the emotional requirements of the job. Um, and so, um, it basically uh, means that um, there is a, an emotional aspect. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but there's a term for it. There's an emotional aspect of, of working as a veterinarian. So um, you can see here on the, um, I'm feeling what you're feeling. You know, you could be in a perfectly good mood, but then you're exposed to somebody who's um, distressed about um, their animal in some way. And before you know it, you kind of feel the way they do. Um, we are hardwired for it. You can see the mother and the baby. That's where we first start to learn to feel what other people feel. And it is um, uh, based in our mirror neuron system, which is the, the, basis, the basis of empathy, really, for human beings. But what it, what it means, then, is that when you are exposed to distressed um, owners, um, it is a healthy and natural um, expectation that you also, your mirror neurons, would cause your own brain to become distressed and to feel those distressed feelings as well. And we, we're less or more aware of those feelings um, 
sometimes we don't know that it's really impacting us until we get home and we try to sleep that night. Um, so I was very interested in this research um, that came out in 2014. Um, in this research, they did find that there was a small but positive correlation between the number of euthanasias and level of depression in veterinarians um, uh, per week. Um, surprisingly, they also found um, that it wasn't the euthanasia itself, it was the counseling around the euthanasia that uh, was um, most associated with depression. They also found that um, working in low-income environments where a veterinarian's hands might be tied to take care of protecting an animal's health um, was the only factor that was associated with increased suicide risk. Um, veterinarians working in higher income communities did not have that same uh, risk. Um, but if we look at um, uh, additional exploration of how uh, people experience uh, euthanasia, in this work, uh, the quotation is that some people um, feel threatened um, or simply experience a philosophical discomfort where others may experience more significant reactions. Um, individuals may or may not experience euthanasia as a major source of stress. So it's different for everyone, both owners and veterinarians. This systematic review um, uh, looked at 12 studies um, and found that working with animals and performing euthanasia can generate traumatic stress reactions and compromise um, the well-being of many um, animal care workers. And in that research, it was the stigma um, that may further compound the effects of occupational stress and compassion fatigue, like the sentiment, I could never do that, I love animals too much. Um, and this brings me back, I'm not sure Dr. Ollender really meant this, but it does bring me back to the part of her presentation um, about, you know, public scrutiny and what that's like um, when one has to do the process of depopulation. Um, so we all come to the table with, and which I was talking here about how all of us have different relationships, different experiences with euthanasia. And so we all come to the table with some raw material that might make us react differently to euthanasia. One is a concept called adverse childhood experiences. These are about 10 factors that happen to 63% of the American population, at least have at least one ace, that are associated with um, difficulty with both mental and also physical health. So um, the degree of a person's experience with ACEs as a child may have an impact on their, uh, how euthanasias impact them. Temperament, we all have different personality styles. Some of us are very shy, some of us are very extroverted. And then, of course, context of the euthanasia. Uh, so depopulation is a quite a different context than um, a hit-by-car dog or um, um, a cancer uh, patient that uh, has had a long process of uh, coming to the decision of euthanasia. All of those are different contexts which have a different impact on how one experiences the euthanasia. Um, as I was thinking about, and I have been kind of reflecting on depopulation for some time now, um, and if we think about it, we could think about here at the bottom left, uh, we have a nervous system, right? And so if we kind of treated uh, or compared that nervous system, our human nervous system, to like a 12-volt uh, cord, um, and I don't know this to be true. I feel very humble, so I'm looking forward to discussion and being taught. But to me, it's kind of like plugging in a 12-volt um, plug into a large power plant, uh, the depopulation, just the amount of sensory kind of experiences and the, vo the sheer volume. And I think that Dr. Olinder did mention that. And the way that it impacts us is, both, is on cognitive levels, physical levels, and emotional levels. So it, it, um, it's not just a thinking thing. It, it really impacts all of who we are. So, uh, well-being, in, in the way I like to define it is well-being is when resources equal demand. And so there are some resources that are needed to meet the emotional labor demands in veterinary medicine. And I think we're growing as a community, as a veterinary community, on, on how to meet, how to build those resources. Um, and one thing that's available starting July 1 is um, a veterinary human support certificate. So it's essentially the vet social work model, um, but uh, targeted towards animal-related professionals. Um, so this is just a little graphic of what it is. I won't go too deeply into it. Um, um, but it is designed to give those resources for managing emo uh, uh, the emotional labor in veterinary practice. Because in, in vet social work, we really do believe that we're better together um, when we work with veterinarians. Uh, social workers are better and, and vice versa, in our opinion. So 
Um, so thank you for your attention. And now I'll be turning it over to um, uh, Dr. Erdman. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you both to our previous presenters for presenting a context for um, the challenges that come with such um, a situation. Um, I have a background in mental health as well. I'm a licensed mental health counselor and um, family therapist. So again, I look at this from a systems perspective. And so if you um, remember many of the things that they talked about, um, when you have a situation such as this, um, there are many, many people who are involved and impacted at many, many different levels. So it's not just the owners of the animals, it's not just the, um, it's not just the veterinarians, but it's many, many people who are impacted. And so what I want to talk to you about today is um, how to communicate bad news to others. And of course, there is no easy way to deliver bad news. Um, so if you're in the situation as a veterinarian and, and involved in such an experience, um, you, it's important to realize there's a lot of anger um, and, um, and frustration and lack of information when you encounter such a situation as um, Dr. Olander presented at the beginning. One of the things to remember is to invest time at the beginning. So when you're meeting with a client, um, take the time to try to understand what the people might be experiencing. If they've been through a situation such as this before, if they have never experienced it before, try to gauge what they know and what their questions are. It's important to elicit others' perspective. Listen, and I can't say enough listen and pause. Um, I know you have a, we'll have a lot of information to deliver and a lot of content, but it's important to know that that information will get out eventually. So rather than trying to do all the talking, allow the, um, the owners of the facility, the, anyone who you may be working with, time to share, ask questions, um, realize that each case that you encounter in a situation such as this might be quite different. And a key thing, I believe, is to don't assume. So don't assume if you've been to one situation like this, every situation will be the same because each one will be, will be unique. As I think we said earlier, demonstrate empathy. Recognize and acknowledge the emotions of others, even if you are realizing, realizing that you're a little bit uncomfortable with, with the situation. Try to restate and convey what you think you heard people saying. So if you're asking questions, or if, or if they have um, stories they want to tell about what has happened, um, try to restate and let them understand that you know what, that, you, that you're hearing them and you know what they're saying. Um, statements such as, you know, I wish I didn't have this news, I'm very sorry, and I know it's a lot for you to deal with, really helps them to feel validated. You don't have all the answers, you can't fix the situation, but you can help them at least feel validated. Statements such as, take your time, I know a lot has happened right now, I can only try and imagine what you're experiencing. Allow for questions at the end. So I know there will be times when you feel like um, there may be a lot of work to do or you may have been at a facility for days or weeks and you feel like your job is over. Um, it's really, really important at the end of the visit, when you're ready to leave, ask if there are other questions. Check in to make sure the information is understood. And again, that's one of the biggest issues. Don't assume that people have heard what you've said or don't assume that they understand everything. People typically only remember a small percentage of what we tell them in stressful situations. And a time such as this when it's very stressful, they'll, they'll, they'll remember really at the beginning only a small percentage of that information. So it's important maybe to repeat information as well. You might say something like, you know, we've given you a lot of information and now I'm wondering what questions do you still have? And then pause for a moment because it's going to take them a while to collect their thoughts and think about what questions they might actually have. When we think about loss, and this is certainly about loss, loss comes in many, many different ways. There are many different types of loss. But grief tends to come in two parts. The first, of course, is the loss, and the second is the remaking of life. And as was stated in our first presenter, um, some of these people might not even know what their future hopes um, is in store for them. 
So even if a client doesn't feel emotionally overwhelmed by the loss or the death of the animals, there may be other types of losses they may be experiencing. It may be a major financial loss. They may be thinking, what do I do now? What is my purpose in life? Many of um, people in large situations, large farms, um, this has been their way of life. And so they live, they eat, and they sleep with many of these animals. And when they've lost this, they've lost sometimes their purpose in life. And you as a veterinarian, it may, may feel like a bit of grief and a, a bit of guilt and that you have taken something away from them. And that's sort of a normal reaction as well. So veterinarians also experience the this, this same type of loss. As we said before, veterinarians are trained to save lives, um, not to take lives away. So for many, especially those in the helping professionals and mental health counselors, we're trained to take care of others. Veterinarians are trained to save lives. They're trained to help animals. They're not trained to, uh, to euthanize animals. And so this makes it very, very difficult to try to accept the fact that, that sometimes this is part of our job. Try to understand your own feelings and what loss has meant to you as well. It's not unusual to when you're in a situation where you're dealing with death for other experiences of your own grief or, or other deaths that you may have experienced to come to surface. And these may be what we call unresolved issues of grief, and you may not even be aware that they exist until all of a sudden they sort of hit you. And you think you remember a time that you have lost something and it brings all of this back. So it's really important to be aware of your own feelings and experiences and your own sensations and feelings and emotions as well as those of your client. There are lots of resources on compassion fatigue. Um, just know that there are many, many ways that you will be impacted by this. It could be psychological. It could be physical. Um, when you're experiencing compassion fatigue and you've been experiencing many, many euthanasias, it may be you just don't want to go to work anymore. You start retreating from families, from friends, isolating yourselves. And so all of this is normal to a certain extent. But if it continues and it impacts your life with your family, with others, or your work, then it really has hit the, the issue of compassion fatigue. And it's time to start thinking about, is there someone who I need to go and talk to as well? I'll give you a few tips on how to de-escalate the situation. And again, this is going to be a difficult time to, be, to, um, to encounter. Sometimes veterinarians may be seen as um, the perpetrators or as the face of government, and it's not unusual for people to direct their anger toward you. And this is generally um, an experience that people have during the time of death. So if you, all of you I know have experienced a time when you've known someone or have experienced yourself in a, a death, and you tend to want to blame someone. Well, it was a doctor's fault or it was an accident that a driver should have been aware of. So it's easy to want to blame. Uh, and, there, and it's a normal process. So one thing is to remember is to listen. So again, just be quiet. Don't feel like you have to have all the answers because you don't, and sometimes there isn't an answer. Give time to ask questions and provide information without getting emotionally involved and without getting defensive. And again, even if a client lash out at you and there may be some some anger um, and some feelings of tension, realize that this is not aim, aimed toward you personally, but toward the situation. So try to collect yourself and, and, and try to get a sense of what you're experiencing as well. One question euthanasia is sometimes veterinarians ask if someone wants to be present, and this is a very precarious situation because the owners may want to help in some way. Um, but because of safety issues, it's generally, I would say, in most cases, this is probably not helpful. But again, they're going to feel like they may want to have a role in this in some way. So it's important for you to talk with them and try to figure out what is the best way that they can help. And maybe the best way is to step aside, let you do your job as a veterinarian, and then come back and recheck with them. And the last slide is just several resources um, that are, will be available to you. Um, psychological first aid, um, tips for responders. Again, any type of first responders that encounter situations that are stressful like this experience the, the same type of emotions. Uh, mental health preparedness, 
traumatic stress, and psychological first aid for veterinarians. These are all excellent resources um, just for you to have available. And now I'm going to uh, present material from Florence Torres Davalos. She is a client, um, she's a behavioral health counselor and grief counselor at William Pritchard Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital at University of California, Davis. Um, and she was presented this present, gave this presentation, but was not able to, um, to join us today. So I'm going to share some of the information on her slides with you. So again, connecting with the client before the meeting, understand the purpose of the visit, the client expectations versus job requirements. Before you meet with your client, it's important, as I said before, to check with yourself. Do a quick body scan. Deep breathing is very important. Check and see how you're feeling. Do you feel tense? And review your own communication skills. Listening skills are important. Empathy, validate. Again, you don't have to have all the answers, but just being present for, your, for the client is tremendously helpful. Think about the purpose of the visit. Ask yourself, does, is this going to evoke stress in me? Is there a relationship of the animal to the owner? What is that relationship and do I know that? Are these animals sort of pets in some way? Do they feel like they, they are really losing something very important to them? And might I be seen as a threat to their livelihood, to their future? Um, through their value system. So remember to breathe in and breathe out. Connecting with the client again before the meeting, think about your own pre-jitters. So think about yourself right now as you're listening to this presentation and do just a very quick body scan. Think about how you're sitting. Are you tense? Do you have particular muscles in your body that you're feeling very, very tight and tense? And try to remember to relax those as much as you can. Think about your breathing. Take deep breath breaths in through your nostrils as sort of like you're smelling the fragrant flower or the rose that you see in the presentation. And then blow out and breathe through your mouth as if you're blowing on hot soup. And it's amazing throughout your, your work with a client to just stop and do some of these quick body checks because it helps you get in touch with what you're experiencing and how you're feeling. So again, remember, breathe in and breathe out. Um, building rapport, again, ask open-ended questions. Assess your client's goals and understandings of the visit. As I stated in the other presentation, um, really find a common ground with your client. What is it that you're hoping to achieve and how can you understand your client's perspectives? Again, think about body language, eye contact, even the tone of your voice. Listen for content and meaning when the other person is talking and try to repeat back in your own words what you're hearing. Again, this makes the client feel very validated and they feel like they, you have really heard. So for example, um, a client does not want to euthanize because it will impact their finances and they have a family to feed. And a response might be, I understand you don't want to euthanize because it will add stress to your family life. It's amazing how a simple statement like this can make a client feel heard and feel validated. And it immediately puts down that, that feeling of defensiveness that they might have. So again, empathy and validation. Try to use the word we when possible to indicate we're doing this together. Show your, your humanity and be authentic and compassionate. And I think that's probably one of the key things is be genuine and authentic. I can only imagine how the financial stress might be difficult for you when you're responsible for taking care of your family. We can review some possible resources and referrals. And again, you're not saying you have the answers, but you're saying, let me help you. Together, we can try to find a way to work through this. So connecting with yourself and managing your frustration, sometimes you might feel like you're in the eye of a hurricane. So remember again, take the deep breath, stay focused on the purpose of the visit, attend to the animal, and try to redirect the discussion so that it's about what you're there to accomplish. And try not to personalize, again, the, the, the personalize the owner's um, upset or the owner's anger. It's not directed toward you. It's directed toward a situation. 
and you happen to be the recipient at the end of that anger. So also watch for over-identifying with the owner. Don't take on, as we talked about the mirror neurons, don't take on the owner's frustration and don't feel like you have the answers and you have to fix the situation because you really can't. So when the visit is done, talk to a trusted support person about any feelings stirred up in you. I hope that there are, are um, personal resources, family, friends. It may be a helping professional that you have that you can turn to for some support. We talked a little bit about how to de-escalate. Again, this is similar to what I said in the previous uh, presentation. Listen, give them time to talk, confirm what you're hearing, uh, maybe identify a neutral setting um, where it's a private setting, but also a neutral setting where you can talk about it, that it's not right in the, in the midst of um, a, a farm or a facility where the euthanasia is happening. And know when to walk away and say, let's stop, let's take a break, and let's get back to this a little later. So again, know the signs of stress that you may be experiencing yourself. If you're feeling overwhelmed, I just can't do this job any longer. If you're feeling very irritable, I don't want to go back out for this next day. I just don't want to do it. Or things that didn't upset you suddenly upset you. If you can't sleep, if you have changes in your eating habits, if you find that you're getting muscle tension and pain in shoulders, quite often it happens in shoulders. Sometimes people feel it in their stomach. So if you're feeling tension in these areas, realize that something is happening to you. If you can't concentrate on other aspects of your job or you just lack motivation and you just, you're just apathetic about your job and about what you have to do, these are all good signs that the stress is really, really, really getting, getting to you more than it should. And again, many of these things are normal to a certain degree, but then on, if, if you're feeling good about it, you have resources to help you reconnect, you, you bounce back after a period of time. So think about the body scan, about deep breathing, about your own personal exercise. Make sure your expectations about the whole situation are realistic and you're not expecting yourself to do more than you can. Have a good support system. Have hobbies. Do something that is fun and have a life outside of work, and I know that's hard for many of us to do. Try not to, I don't say don't, because I know many, I know all of us do, but try not to take your, your work home with you. And if you have a mental health counseling and employee assistance program available to you, uh, know that that's available and that you can take part of that. There's a 24-hour national crisis line, 1-800-273-8255, and this is confidential emotional support for those experiencing a suicidal crisis or emotional distress. And I encourage you, if you're ever feeling like you just really need someone to talk to and have no one else, this is a great resource. So thank you very much for your time. Personally, I have always felt that the best doctor in the world is a veterinarian. He can't ask his patients what is the matter. He's just got to know. Thank you. All right, now we've gotten to the Q&A portion of today's uh, conference. So you can submit your question in writing by selecting all panels from the drop-down menu in the chat panel. Enter your question in the message box provided and send. You can also ask your question verbally by dialing pound 2 on your telephone keypad. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted, at which point please state your name and question. Again, you can submit your question in writing. Just remember to select all panelists from the drop-down menu or dial pound 2 on your telephone keypad. We did get a written question that came in. Will slides be available to get those links? This is Shanna. We'll provide some links um, in the chat box, and I will also look into providing links in some way along with the video of the webinar later on. All right, at this time, I'm not showing any other questions. Again, if you would like to ask a question, dial pound two on your telephone keypad or uh, send it in writing using the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. Remember to select all panelists before submitting your question. Um, we do have um, a question that just came in. I am new in my position as a counselor and wellness coordinator for a vet med program. What are some things that you think I should focus on with the students? 
Um, this is Elizabeth Strand. I would love to hear from the folks that are attending this webinar what the counselor should focus on, um, what you wish you had learned in vet school. Um, you know, I, I think from my perspective, uh, working in a veterinary college and teaching veterinary students, it's really hard for us to compete with getting a good grade on an anatomy exam. So we can tell them communication skills and we can tell them they need to take care of themselves. Um, but it doesn't compete with those important tests and uh, tasks that have to be done to complete veterinary college. Um, and things become very relevant once they get into practice. Um, so certainly I think focusing on well-being behavior is important, um, but I would love to hear from other folks uh, suggestions for this counselor of what she should focus on for the vet students if anybody's got any ideas. Hi, and this is Phyllis. Um, having trained many, many counselors <laughs> um, and worked also with veterinary students and tried to pair veterinary students and counselors together, I think just helping them to learn some basic skills, basic um, communication skills and listening. The experience that I've had in working with veterinary students um, and helping them process grief is that they, again, they tend to feel like they have to have all the answers and they have to fix the situation. So I think some basic skills on just listening, reflecting back is what we call basic 101 counseling skills. Um, listening, reflecting back, and um, helping people to feel validated. I think if they get through those steps, they've done um, a tremendous amount with their clients. All right, I'm not showing any other questions at this time. Um, I'm just going to share, this is Dr. Strand, just share the link to the Vet Social Work Human Support Certificate in case anybody's interested. And I'm also curious, did we, um, did we get word um, in question number two, describe the greatest challenge uh, helping others cope with grief? Is that something we, we got answers to? Um, unfortunately, I can't seem to get the poll results themselves to show, but I will say that um, uh, the first question, um, which was, have you been involved in depopulation or euthanasia, uh, 29 people said that they had and 16 said that they hadn't. I don't currently have access for the uh, using one word to describe um, the greatest challenge in helping others cope with grief and loss during an animal disease outbreak. But if you want to just uh, put that in the chat, that would be fantastic. We'll collect them there as well. Just remember to select all panelists uh, from the drop-down menu. So you can see the poll results on the right now. Um, and again, if you do want to answer the second question in the chat, feel free to do so. We can collect those words there. And at this time, I'm not showing any other questions. Uh, someone said that they uh, said disconnection was uh, the one word that they would use to describe their experience. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and just if I can comment on disconnection, I think that's a, a normal response um, because mm -hmm. it, it's a lack of what else can I do? And I'm afraid if I get too involved, I'm going to become overwhelmed. So disconnection is safer. Um, than the fear of getting lost in someone else's grief. So I think that's a normal process. And I think the more that 
we can understand that we don't have to fix things and it's not up to ourselves, the more that we can be there present for the client to help them with what they're experiencing. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I think that um, this is Dr. Strand. I also think that um, uh, having an environment where it is normal to turn to your colleague and to state to your colleague, whoa, that was really rough, I'm noticing I'm having trouble sleeping, or um, it was really hard with that particular farmer. Um, and to be able to uh, connect with each other is curative, frankly. Um, what happens in compassion fatigue and emotional labor is if we are having distressing thoughts and feelings, um, it's tempting to isolate, especially if we begin to compare ourselves to others who seem to have it together. And so cultivating, and, and today, um, just thank you so much for hosting this topic, um, because just today is uh, creating the discussion of how to be effective with counseling clients and also to have a way to uh, stay connected to uh, oneself and one's health uh, when engaging in this really um, core part of some veterinarians' work, uh, where euthanasia is a part of work. Um, and so I think, I think this and being able to talk about it without feeling like if you're distressed, there's something wrong but rather if you're distressed, that's a normal response and let me stay connected to somebody is really, um, really, I think, curative, frankly, just because I've seen veterinarians do it with each other and it just it makes the world a difference. So my two cents. <laughs> we also got some other written feedback. Uh, someone said that as, a, as an administrative assistant, I met with producers on a large animal outbreak. It was extremely stressful when we started meeting the producers who were angry and unsure of what to expect. As the day went on, the producers realized that we listened and they were calmed and started sharing their stories. Thank you for the presentation. That's great. So listening, as Dr. Um, Erdman was talking about, the importance of taking that time to listen, and it, it was able to turn things around for the farmers in terms of their anger, the producers uh, in terms of their anger. It's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. I wonder if there's other success stories of how you all have managed communication. Like what are the tips and tricks you have for each other and for us <laughs> of how you've managed um, these, these situations? Offer your feedback in writing by using the chat option. Just remember to select all panelists from the drop-down menu, or you can dial pound two on your telephone keypad to enter uh, to you know, offer some verbal feedback as well. Hi, this is Doris Olander. Uh, one of the things that I've found is very helpful is when dealing with the producers to go to a place where the whole staff on the farm or at the location doesn't have to hear the producer and that you can again listen to them but mm -hmm. at the same time what they say which may not be what they would wish to have said later is not heard by all the team out there. Mm -hmm. So creating that little private space for the producer to um, communicate what their reactions are without affecting, by having other people hear what they're saying is helpful. Yes. I'm not showing any other feedback at this time. We do give many thanks to the presenters for the work you do and for the presentation.
Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity, and thank you to all of you who are out doing this great work. It's difficult, I know, and I have my utmost respect for what you do. Yes, I second that. All right, and that concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. You may now disconnect.